Well, thanks uh, every, everyone for uh, taking a, a view on our video feed here at Hudson Institute. I'm David Asher. I'm a senior research fellow, uh, resident at Hudson. Uh, I cover uh, a variety of things, including everything from counter threat finance and terrorism financing, sanctions, sanctions evasion to nuclear, biological, chemical weapons proliferation, uh, an area I've worked on very extensively in the government. And I just want to uh, introduce today uh, Dr. Robert Cadlick, a colleague who has uh, done uh, pioneering work in this area for the, the U.S. government, uh, going back to his time just starting at the U.S. Uh, uh, Air Force Academy and then moving into the military for uh, a few decades and then uh, working at, in very high-ranking roles at uh, Health and Human Services, uh, conceiving and developing our national biodefense strategy, and then uh, having to try to execute it in the midst of the biggest bio threat uh, disaster, actually, I have to say, in uh, history, which was the outbreak of COVID-19. So I'm here to uh, uh, discuss that with Dr. Cadillac and also to um, uh, go over uh, some of the lessons learned over his long and illustrious career. So uh, let's go on and move forward from here. Um, the, the most important thing uh, I would like to uh, highlight today is the, is the importance of this report called Muddy Waters, which is about the origins of COVID-19. And uh, it's a report that came out from the Senate Health Committee. Uh, Dr. Gallick uh, introduced that. We're, uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll overview that report. But that report is one of the most important reports about COVID-19 to have been issued, if not the most important. Uh, in its origins and the uh, relationship of COVID-19 to the Chinese government. So on that note, I'd like to introduce Dr. Cadillac, uh, uh, Baba. Uh, I don't know if you want to give any background on how you came to get involved in health and uh, human services and then how you made your way up to Capitol Hill, but we'd be interested in that. Well, well, thank you, David. And, and certainly it's a pleasure to appear with you today and, and certainly for uh, your colleagues at Hudson Institute and the viewership. Just want to say thank you for this opportunity, number one. Uh, number two, how did I get here? Well, the simplest thing to say is uh, I would say I'm a three-peat offender, having worked on Capitol Hill for Senator Richard Burr, first when he was a junior senator from North Carolina when he was first selected in 0506, then when he became the chairman of the Senate uh, Select Committee on Intelligence, uh, where I was the deputy staff director from uh, 2015 to 2017, and then uh, with the election of Donald Trump, uh, was asked by uh, then Representative uh, Tom Price to become his Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, uh, which is kind of an er uh, interesting turn of events because when I first worked for Richard Burr in 0506, we actually wrote the enabling uh, authorization legislation that created the ASPR, the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, and BARDA, the Biomedical Advanced Research Development uh, Authority, which was central to the uh, genesis of warp speed during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, well, I mean, you, yeah, I should have credited your work on the Hill as well, but you, you know, you, you've done so many different things, but that, that those were very important efforts. The, I mean, of course, the, the, the immediate question that we can talk to talk about later is really uh, what happened because we had the exact uh, appropriate architecture that you'd help develop for the government and I don't think it failed us I think it did contribute significantly people just totally underrate how the uh, work that you had done uh, with a small group of colleagues uh, created Operation Warp Speed and created uh, the ability of us to manufacture and will develop and manufacture mRNA vaccines. But um, before we go to that, I think it would be great to get your uh, overview personally of the report you did called Muddy Waters about the origins of COVID-19. Um, it is, like I said, the uh, most detailed and, and most, uh, frankly, most uh, enlightening report that I've read at the unclassified level. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously you, you, were, you were doing this uh, for Senator Burr. Uh, uh, and, 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 and the other Republican members of the health committee. But if you could explain a little bit about how you got into it, what motivated you and, and sort of initially uh, uh, and, and, and what you learned along the way. Sure. Well, first of all, it was a, uh, a task that was uh, assigned to me on 7 June 2021, my second day back on the Hill working for Senator Burr. 
His intent with, uh, frankly, Chairman uh, Patty Murray, who was the rank, uh, pardon me, the chairwoman for the help committee was to create a bipartisan investigation uh, using only open source information to uh, determine if, if possible, the origins of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, that uh, task really was focusing for 20 months during my tenure on the Hill uh, to look at two different hypotheses. One, whether or not the, uh, the, the virus emerged from a zoonotic event, which was from an animal, possibly a bat, or some intermediate species such as pangolin or uh, palm civet. Uh, or was this uh, a consequence of some kind of laboratory research that was being conducted in Wuhan, possibly at the Wuhan Institute of Virology? Uh, the approach we took was very uh, simplistic, really based on what the intelligence community uses as an approach, kind of looking at an evaluation of plausible sub-hypotheses. Is it, is it conceivable that under each of those two larger headings, could there be uh, reasonable or possible events that could result in a pandemic? And conveniently, we found three sub-hypotheses for each of those categories. And then uh, we conducted our investigation as a team of teams, which is we created um, a team A and team B, led by two lawyers who uh, conveniently worked for me both at HHS and now at the Senate Help Committee uh, Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee. And they led the effort to accrue evidence from open source materials, uh, validating the material or information as we could, uh, that would align to either a zoonotic uh, origin or a lab research origin. And, and that's how we proceeded. And we were backed up by a uh, fairly uh, extensive outside technical team, people that we solicited for their insights, many of them who offered their time freely, willingly, and free to, uh, to, to provide us uh, technical insights as it relates to biosafety, molecular biology, epidemiology, medical infectious diseases. So we had another dozen people outside the six or seven that we had, in, in, you know, dedicated to the effort. Yes, I met uh, several of, of your team members uh, uh, early on, and I was very impressed by them as an exceptionally high quality group of people they have on Capitol Hill uh, uh, to take time to, to do and to, to undertake an effort that was really unpopular. Let's face it, uh, at the time, no one really uh, was. Uh, well, people may have been interested in knowing the origin, but the government, the uh, executive branch, uh, was not particularly interested in sharing information related to that. And so to do something at the unclassified level, particularly, was extremely uh, difficult. And to do it in a way that was truly not biased, where you had one team that was sort of pro or uh, uh, lab leak, the other team that was essentially uh, focused on, on natural origin uh, and, and trying to gather evidence for each hypothesis was... Um, was especially uh, uh, grueling, I think, uh, and difficult to, to undertake. Uh, but uh, you certainly did a great job, as I've read this uh, report, which is about 300 pages, about 200 pages of text, and then uh, of written text, and then about 100 pages of footnotes. And those footnotes are, are, are very important. Um, what could you say about some of the things that you learned uh, 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 regarding the origin that really changed uh, or, or shaped your view um, in the course of doing the report, putting aside what you learned in the, in the context of the government and from other sources that aren't available. Um, I noticed that you, you, you did uh, dwell on the, the, the quite sharp increase in influenza-like illness in, in China in the fall of 2019, for example. If you could sort of give us a few minutes of detail on that. Be great. Sure. Uh, well, one of the things that uh, what we did differently uh, from the intelligence community, and we we were beneficiaries of the unclassified report by the Office of Director of National Intelligence, and we did at some point in time get uh, access to the classified report. Uh, but I think the key thing is, is that we opened the aperture of our investigation that it, that proceeded well beyond uh, the time frame that the uh, DNI did. So for example, we looked uh, well beyond the fall of 2019 and going back actually to the fall of 2018 uh, and even earlier to evaluate what would say the trajectory of coronavirus research in China, particularly at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. 
just recognize that the WIV, as the Wuhan Institute of Virology is known as, is not the only institution in Wuhan that does this kind of research. There are a number of colleges, universities, uh, veterinary schools that, uh, that participate. And so it was really to understand what was the kind of baseline, if you will. What we learned uh, through this kind of uh, uh, temporal evaluation that began uh, literally in 2017 when the construction of the uh, Wuhan Institute of Virology's Biosafety 4 laboratory was completed was that there were challenges that they were confronting from the very beginning in terms of accessing materials, expertise, and particularly operationalizing what is a high containment laboratory, a BSL-4, the highest level that you can have, that China had very little experience uh, in dealing with or, or managing or operating. So as you go forward, you realize that in November 18th, and this was something that the State Department recognized as well, that, that they reported on the fact that there were a lot of concerns from the Chinese, as well as from outside experts, including US scientists who visited, that indicated that there seemed there could be a risk to what China was doing as it related to some of this uh, cutting edge technology or cutting edge research with coronaviruses and the possibility of not having the highest levels of biosafety as a consequence of not only constructing a new facility, but actually operating and maintaining this facility. So coming uh, coming to your point about what happened, when did it happen, we found some early indicators that there were concerns around biosafety going into the spring of 2019 at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And as that time uh, progressed, we also recognized that there seemed to be even greater concerns as it related to the nature of some of the research that was being performed there, particularly some of the, uh, the research that was seemed to be, be performed at a lower level of biosafety than typically encountered in other laboratories around the world, particularly the United States. An example, uh, just to give you a little flavor of what we found, and this leads to what happened in, we believe, to the fall of 2019. Every spring and summer, the Wuhan Institute of Virology would go on field expedition, uh, expeditions to southern China where SARS coronaviruses were found. This is found in nature, and they would, uh, would go into caves, capturing bats, recovering samples from bats, and then taking the samples and sometimes the bats themselves back to Wuhan and to the Wuhan Institute of Virology, where they would process the samples oftentimes at a biosafety two laboratory level, which is like your dentist's office is when you go get your teeth cleaned or whatever. And so we recognize that some of the risk was when they would retrieve these bats and process these samples, oftentimes in lower than acceptable uh, biosafety levels, that could be a risk. The second part of it was, is that actually, um, they would actually do some genetic manipulation of these uh, viruses, oftentimes in biosafety two levels as well. This is documented both in published literature, dissertations that were uh, released from the Wuhan Institute of Virology, and actually Sheng Li Shi, the bat lady's own admissions. So when we get to the fall of 2019, we see that there is um, this research is ongoing, and there's this uh, explosion of cases of influenza-like illness that begin probably in late October, early November. How do we know this? Well, probably the most uh, compelling um, observations are made by U.S. diplomats in the Wuhan consulate who report both to um, their colleagues at Beijing and it filters back to the U.S. that there seems to be a vicious flu outbreak occurring in late October, early November of 2019. This information is further co uh, corroborated uh, by, um, by the fact that there are some studies that were produced by Harvard that identified there was increased hospital traffic, there was increased uh, uh, searches on their search engine like uh, Google called Baidu for, for symptoms that comport with what COVID-19 was at that time, as well as other reports from our State Department that indicated possibly with researchers became uh, sick with COVID-like symptoms in early November, and the South China Morning Post uh, releasing a, uh, a a China CDC report that the first um, the first um, 
case or documented case of COVID may have happened as early as 17 November. All these things coalesce uh, to a report that was done by Chinese epidemiologists that was published later in 2020 that showed this very large spike of influenza-like illness. And China itself released information to the WHO in April of 2021 that indicated there was a surge in influenza-like cases in early November that were not associated with testing up for influenza. So you have this whole mass of events that would say, hey, it's possible, more probable, that cases of that were occurring of influenza-like illness that occurred in early November were likely associated with COVID's first emergence. Yeah, I mean, that's a, <clears throat> something that I observed as the lead investigator in the origin of COVID-19 for the Secretary of State at, at the State Department and ultimately uh, reporting up to the National Security Council as well. We saw that spike. We, we it, it was captured in Chinese statistics, okay? Um, uh, and then uh, we saw a lot of uh, anomalous uh, 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 data uh, that is totally unclassified coming off social media in China, uh, in this, particularly in late November into early December of 2019, that was uh, 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 contiguous or ran, ran in parallel to, to the uh, uh, increases in ILI in influenza-like illness that were not testing positive for influenza. And so if I'm a detective and so are you, Dr. Bob, um, and your team. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. We've never seen something. And I, 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 I will um, uh, always be a little bit cautious as to we, there's certain things we don't know, but we know a lot if you put together the mosaic and you'll see there's not that many pictures, uh, the pieces miss, missing from the picture, I should say. Uh, the, 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 uh, the picture is pretty, pretty uh, uh, incriminating. And then could you comment on what evidence did you find that there was a natural origin, if any? Did you see oh. indications coming out of China from the Chinese themselves that they had discovered something? Did you see them acting in a way that wasn't um, uh, panicky? Uh, regarding the origin or what was panicky. Is there something that, about the behavior of the Chinese government that you observed uh, from metadata, let's say, or from just reading the, the, the press that convinced any of your team that they didn't know where this thing came from? Well, it, it's interesting that you say that because probably the, ben the benefit of doing uh, the, 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 the investigation that we did, where we had a team A and team B, was trying to accrue all the evidence that we could from all sources that were published or otherwise that would have would provide at least some reason to believe that that this could have been a zoonotic uh, event, meaning coming from an animal. And and what we found quite strikingly is that even though precedence favors that, um, if you will, answer, there was no uh, documented information or evidence that would support that. So, for example, uh, when uh, SARS originally occurred in 2002 and three in China, and by the way, was also subject to a cover up by the Chinese government, what we were what we were able to ascertain was they were able to identify fairly rapidly an intermediate host, this case, a palm civet that was being sold in wet markets. This was a food source. And so the animals would be slaughtered by the by the animal handlers. And interesting enough, Typically, animal handlers were some of the first people to get sick with SARS in 2003 and 4. So fast forward to 2019, 2020, uh, we don't see any evidence, and China has not been able to produce an intermediate host uh, for this that may include, and there was a lot of recent to do about a raccoon dog and a palm civet, but none of those animals were found to be infected with uh, SARS-CoV-2, nor were any animal handlers uh, found to become infected with that. Interesting enough, uh, there was a study published in the spring of 2020 that indicated that they were doing uh, longitudinal surveys of the seven wet markets in Wuhan three years prior to the pandemic. And interesting enough, they weren't, they weren't looking for SARS-CoV-2, but two things were notable from that study. First of all, that animals that were susceptible for SARS-CoV-2, like the raccoon dog palm civets were sold there, but interesting enough, no bats were sold there. And why is that important? Because the bats were a very important source of the virus in Southern China, where the bats and the susceptible animals 
were brought to the wet markets together where they were sold as food. So, interesting enough, bats are not a food source in Wuhan. Interesting enough, it's a local delicacy, not one in Wuhan. And quite frankly, um, it's kind of an anomaly to see it, nor were pangolins sold in the wet markets. So we could say that at least from the standpoint of historic precedents, historic evidentiary data, that key connections that would normally be found in historic cases of SARS transmission documented previously were absent in Wuhan at that time. What was really kind of interesting is that we showed evidence, particularly in this early November timeframe, of what would have been concerted government activities that would suggest something did happen, likely at the Wuhan Institute of Virology and possibly at the Wuhan University Animal, mm -hmm. uh, 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 pardon me, Inst Institute of Animal Models. Uh, why do we think that? Well, we found some um, reports that would indicate that at that same time, there were publications, probably deceptive in nature, that were trying to cover the tracks, if you will, of the involvement of the Wuhan Institute of Virology BSL-4 laboratory and the Wuhan mm -hmm. University. The second thing is we had a high level Chinese uh, official come from China's Academy of Sciences on the 19th of November, where he did a couple of interesting things. This his his day of arrival uh, was uh, was notable because it was subject of an internal posting on the Wuhan Institute of Virology website that indicated that he met with senior leadership and read what was likely a P sure, which is a uh, Chinese uh, mechanism of reporting that often goes through political channels. To the, to the highest level that is needed to resolve an issue or a problem. And then that individual sends back down instructions. It appears that this chap from Beijing was carrying orders from Xi Jinping himself that indicated there were concerns around biosecurity around the, the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And, and, and in fact, that he was lecturing them about issues that were a matter of national concern. So, so we do know on the 19th of November, uh, the, uh, a senior official from the Chinese Academy of Sciences, their lead biosecurity official came down to the Wuhan Institute of Virology and met with senior leadership and brought with him a P. Sure, which is by description orders from a high level senior official. In this case, uh, the official from Beijing brought down instructions directly from Xi Jinping related to the issues around biosecurity at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Uh, the very next day, he, he also led a two and a half day uh, remedial biosafety training program for members at the WIV, as well as at the Wuhan University, as well as some other institutes in Wuhan, indicating something may have happened. Uh, coincidentally, at the same day that he arrived on the 19th of November, uh, the Wuhan Institute of Virology issued a short notice procurement for a, uh, for a device that would be added to an autoclave uh, exhaust pipe called an air incinerator, which is um, quite an unusual activity, uh, but would suggest possibly there was some kind of possibly infectious release from an autoclave. Autoclaves are used to sterilize infectious waste from biosafety laboratories. And oftentimes by the use of steam, pressure, and temperature over time, that renders whatever infectious material is inert or uncontaminated. But for some reason, on the very day this gentleman came from Beijing, they actually had to order a special device that would augment the sterilization capacity of this autoclave. So there is there is circumstantial evidence, at least uh, in my mind, that, that there may have been some kind of event that uh, preceded his arrival that required the, uh, the, the response of a high level official, uh, awareness by the senior government, as well as remediation efforts that were taken at the WIV. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and I want to add something that's not uh, been uh, noted in publications or in the media up to now. Uh, that we noticed that Hudson in our research uh, recently, uh, uh, Dr. Ji Cheng Cheng, that uh, official who is quite important, uh, was sent by the Communist Party uh, leadership to uh, from Beijing to Wuhan, is now the head of biosafety at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. 
in the Chinese. It's only on the Chinese website of the Wuhan Institute. Uh, it's not in English, but it's <laughs> somewhat telling that the guy who was dispatched to apparently read the riot act to Wuhan Institute has been put in charge of uh, biosafety itself. Um, this is a, uh, more than an anomaly. I'm a, as, like I said, someone who's been a detective and worked on major crime investigations in my career, as well as uh, 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 other types of uh, work against uh, proliferation networks and uh, criminal networks. Uh, but but the, 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 this is something that I find almost unbelievable in that, uh, you know, the guy who is, you know, really the top uh, person in the Chinese uh, Academy of Sciences in Beijing is now yeah, Wuhan. I can't imagine that he's there for uh, for no reason. Um, I don't know, but Dr. Bob, if you have any thoughts on that. No, I, that that was a bit of a revelation when you sent that to me, and I and I have to admit that's an important additional finding. And, and again, if if you consider as we've looked longitudinal longitudinally, and again, this was a little different than our colleagues in the intelligence community that we were able to document things that occurred a year after after the the date or what we believe was the time frame when we think something happened that you would still find evidence of remediation um, activities for example uh, the, uh, the the Wuhan Institute of Virology issued a patent to to reformulate its disinfectant that it found to be extraordinarily corrosive um, to uh, sensitive biosafety equipment at the WIV that at least according to the description in the patent uh, may have resulted or contributed uh, to the escape of highly pathogenic microorganisms from the WIV, uh, though it wasn't specific as to the time frame, but it was specific to the idea that these events could have significant impact on the loss of lives, the effect of social order, uh, as well as uh, the risk uh, to the globe. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask you as a someone who has a, a long and distinguished background in biology, virology, and you're not you're not just a, a, a government servant. You are a practitioner uh, and someone who's worked in the field uh, for the U.S. military, uh, chasing these uh, pathogens and also doing uh, 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 training. Uh, to prepare for them, and I want to definitely want to turn to that in a, a minute. <clears throat> when you look at the sequence, one of the things, did you see irregularities the way that some of the colleagues I had uh, at the less at the State Department itself, although our, our medical director certainly felt there was something very strange about the fur and cleavage site and, and saw that like within literally two weeks of once we had the sequence and they looked at it. Um, uh, what I heard from some of the national laboratories was that they felt there was uh, signature uh, elements that indicated bioengineering, um, uh, and, and a lot of it goes back to the to the uh, 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 phylogenetic uh, information related to to, the, to COVID. And it's and as Dr. Redfield uh, explained, it's pre -ad it seemed pre adapted to spread for human human transmission. Could you comment on that? Yeah, well, it is a, a significant um, finding, and, and quite frankly, in our in our study of this, this is the first, um, I would say, the first uh, SARS-like coronavirus. And again, there are very different subgenuses of this uh, virus, but the ones that belong to SARS, particularly SARS-1 and SARS-2, that do not have a furin cleavage site. And again, the furin cleavage site is the secret sauce that really gives this virus uh, uh, unusual qualities to not only grow uh, extensively in human uh, lung tissue, uh, but also can, uh, also kind of uh, kind of uh, uh, facilitates its spread, its transmissibility. So to, to Dr. Redfield's comment, yes, this is a highly transmissible human transmissible virus that is at kind of at odds with what we've historically known or seen in SARS-related viruses previously. The, the existence of a furin cleavage site uh, as to be uh, described by a group of researchers at Mount Sinai who are in the midst of pro uh, publishing their results uh, feel that the existence of the furin cleavage site is, is a remote probability event. Uh, it's not impossible, but certainly very, very remote in likelihood 
as it relates to this kind of virus. Uh, it is one thing that Dr. David Baltimore, a Nobel laureate, said that at least to him was constituted the possibility of being the smoking gun. Um, what makes it even more kind of compelling, honestly, is what we were able to discern in our investigation that had to do with a proposal that was submitted by EcoHealth Alliance uh, fronting for a number of U.S. and Chinese investigators that in March of 2018 wanted to do further collection of uh, SARS-like viruses in the wild, but specifically mentioned and intended to insert human furin cleavage sites to evaluate their impact on the potential pandemic uh, uh, value or, or, or possibility of a SARS-related virus. So you have this uh, kind of odd set of circumstances when you talk about the remote probability of this occurring in nature. You have uh, an intent a year prior of the desire, even though it wasn't funded by DARPA, it has been suggested by some that the fact that it was conceived as a possible experiment was more likely than not something that was either ongoing or completed at the time that proposal was submitted uh, to, to DARPA, for example. And then the third element is, is that there are other factors in the virus that just seem to optimize its ability to infect humans uh, in a way that, quite frankly, is, uh, is kind of unusual regardless. As you've seen, this, this virus almost has a mind of its own. I don't want to say it's artificially intelligent, but it certainly has been able to circumvent vaccines that we developed initially and has repeatedly developed variants over time that, that seem to kind of challenge us and make this a persistent threat um, in, in many cases where usually pandemics kind of die out and go away. This one kind of uh, gives us the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah, I mean, I I, I, um, um, I know you know Dr. Ralph Barrick uh, from University of North Carolina. I've spoken with him as well. Um, I think I don't think anyone doubts his brilliance, um, uh, but especially given his brilliance, uh, I think it's important to reflect on the fact that he uh, was to he was uh, in the, the project diffuse proposal to DARPA that you outlined. Um, he was uh, going to uh, invest the furin cleavage site artificially using synthetic biology into um, the uh, a coronavirus uh, backbone. Um, and if that could occur naturally, I don't really see a reason, especially given the, the, the knowledge of coronaviruses that Dr. Barrick has, uh, which is almost off the charts, um, that, that you would... You, you, if, it, if it could be done through serial passaging, let's say, even through just pa passing your blood from a, uh, let's say, a uh, monkey, uh, excuse me, a bat to a monkey and, and, and then back and forth. Uh, <coughs> um, if that could happen naturally, then why would you have to it's artificially insert it? It doesn't make any sense. I mean, I would say that if he didn't, if, he, if they thought that could happen naturally, they wouldn't be in the business of trying to synthetically engineer it. That's just my read. I don't know what you think of that, because I, I do want to get at the issue of synthetic biology as part of this, because I think that people are underestimating, and this gets to your work, uh, the, you know, now national biodefense strategy, um, which preceded COVID-19 and did suggest the potential for a lab leak as an origin of a biodefense threat that can uh, terrorize and affect our country. <clears throat> Could you just sort of talk a little bit about bio? Um, about uh, synthetic biology and, and the upsides and the downsides, sure. <clears throat> including what they're doing in Wuhan. And sorry for the long question there. Sure. Well, first of all, it, you know, the idea of synthetic biology is has been uh, something that has been a, a matter of fascination uh, going back into the 1950s when when uh, when DNA uh, was first discovered by Watson and Crick, and the possibility of manipulating uh, the genetic code to get some kind of favorable events, and, and so. You know, in today's world, synthetic biology offers some really interesting, promising opportunities uh, to, to provide new food sources, better medicines, uh, you know, remediate the environment, provide new sources of energy. These are all pluses that, quite frankly, gain of function like uh, research could result in. However, uh, when you talk about pathogenic organisms like uh, potentially coronaviruses or influenza viruses, uh, it, it certainly offers the opportunity to do as we 
think could have happened. Uh, you know, and again, people say it happens naturally. It does, but do so in a way that quite, quite frankly, would want to anticipate nature, but is also doing things that nature has not yet demonstrated itself. And yeah. so that's the that's the divergence, I think, of of what you can do with science and what you should do with science. And and I think the challenge that we think may have been uh, confronted or or at least uh, kind of encountered by the Chinese is that they were doing research uh, in in some ways collaborating with the United States in some ways getting funded by the United States through NIH grants where they were trying to do cutting edge research where their their means to protect themselves and protect maybe others and the world. Uh, may have been jeopardized either by their uh, interest to do this science or their zeal to show progress in the science or or to demonstrate their superiority in this science that could have uh, could have resulted in this kind of outcome. So, you know, from the standpoint of synthetic biology, you'd like to say it's generally good until it goes bad. <laughs> and with that, I think it is the the the, the necessity for uh, policymakers here in the United States to realize that you know there are a lot of good things we can derive from it, but we really need to be especially sensitive and concerned about where bad things could occur. And that could be based on the fact of pursuing gain of function like experiments that quite frankly are novel and, and maybe neat for scientific publication, but quite frankly, the need to know of these things could, could be uh, representing a proliferation risk to your earlier comments about the proliferation of this of this technology is that quite frankly as it emerges as something that pretty much anybody can do if you can't put safeguards around what should be done uh, either by uh, preventing funding of this kind of research or ensuring the safety of this kind of research or evaluating who's doing it the end users whether their intents are good bad or or otherwise uh, malicious then I think we're setting ourselves up for another repeat of this kind of event. Yeah, I mean, I agree as someone who, who oversaw the investigative efforts and, and also uh, worked uh, very closely to uh, <clears throat> with the Office of the Director of National Intelligence and our Secretary of State, uh, uh, Michael Pompeo, and his staff to try to get uh, information regarding uh, origins that have been collected in the fall of 2019 but never disseminated as something that reminded uh, you and I both went through 9-11, I think, and you were at the vice president's office uh, not uh, in that period. And I was working for Secretary Powell, um, but it was a, um, it was a, 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 a when I saw the initial uh, information uh, that hadn't even been pushed out from certain intelligence uh, community partners um, about workers falling sick in the lab, the military funding research that looked to be it was classified research. We put that out in the declassified fact sheet uh, that had been going on since at least 2017 into advanced coronaviruses. Um, uh, in, in, in it appeared creating new types of coronavirus variants that could be uh, uh, lethal or high, and highly pathogenetic. Um, and that was part of a systematic uh, uh, employment of. Uh, what we believe to be synthetic biology in large part, but not exclusively. Um, and, 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 and also experiments on animals that would be in the uh, primate category, uh, uh, it, 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 as well as the animals that were very uh, odd, like pangolins, by the way, uh, yes. may not exist in the market, but according to our declassified intelligence, they highly likely existed inside the Wuhan Institute of Virology's uh, laboratories, and most likely the Wuhan, the Wuhan University, which has a huge animal uh, uh, husbandry program. Uh, but when we saw all that, and, and you know, we it, it caused us to say, oh my God, it, you know, uh, this really may have come out of a lab leak but that 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 bothered us um the lack of transparency in china but the cover-up of everything associated with what happened in wuhan starting in the fall of 2019 uh, and something you exposed in, in the report with your colleagues um they started to uh marshal their uh resources for ppe for for pandemic preventive equipment um uh, I mean, you know, they stopped exporting stuff uh, in the late fall to the United States and elsewhere. They started to buy things, uh, PPE up on the global market. I mean, in this case, 
you know, we really have to ask ourselves, is the cover up worse than the crime? And the, our lack of intelligence that was at least immediate and ready on that was probably one of the biggest failures, if not the single biggest failure in the history of intelligence going well beyond biomedical. I just wanted to ask you as a guy who's worked like me in the intelligence world, who cares deeply about the, the, the work we do and wants to be right. <laughs> what, what happened? Well, well, it's a great question. And quite frankly, um, you know, I, I, you know, we both lived through the Iraq uh, intelligence tobacco yeah. and, and yeah. obviously that had a searing uh, impact on our U.S. intelligence community, particularly on these topical areas. But yeah. what really define what kind of really kind of uh, gets my uh, dander up, particularly about this, uh, your question is that we know that U.S. diplomats in Wuhan knew something was happening in late October, November, that was transmitted to Beijing. There were two U.S. health attaches in Beijing at the time. Yeah. And we spoke to the junior person whose, whose responsibilities included being the coordinator for pandemic preparedness, who was totally unaware, totally unaware of anything occurring in Wuhan or in China as of late December. That to me is, uh, is one of the things that I find most outrageous that in some ways the intelligence community for all its benefits and all its limitations uh, can't do everything. But here's, here is a group of individuals uh, who were, who were assigned to the CDC uh, that whose responsibility was for uh, kind of working with their Chinese colleagues, being the eyes and ears for the U S government, not knowing anything was going on. And that the first the first word that uh, Dr. Redfield got was not from one of his own people in Beijing, but from the director of the Chinese CDC on 4 January. That to me is 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 something that, quite frankly, I personally have a lot of um, a lot of intense emotion about because my job was to prepare and respond to these events, and I found out on the 6th of January, two days later. So you're telling me we lost 60 days of indications and warnings about an event that we could have at least have been aware of. The reason why this is important, and I'll just use an example from my own personal experience, is that in September 2020, I traveled with Secretary Azar to Taiwan. And uh, one of the individuals we met with was the vice president at that time, who was a medical epidemiologist, who shared with me the fact that Taiwan understood something was going on in Wuhan in November. There was a mysterious pneumonia going on. And in, in the case of Taiwan, because of the SARS experience they had in 2003 and four, they instituted in early December, travel screening, travel restrictions and masking. And oh, by the way, their first cases of uh, COVID-19 did not occur until April, 2022 two years and three months yeah. after it emerged in Wuhan. So my my question to you is, does early warning and intelligence matter? Yes, it does. Uh, we supposed to be, you know, the watchword is whole of government. Uh, you know, we had people there who whose job it was to, to keep an eye out on the risks of pandemics emerging from China. And I don't know if they were asleep at the switch or or what but clearly that's something that has to be run down well i mean this brings me uh to the national defense uh national biodefense strategy of 2018 which you i believe were deeply involved in and, and i just wanted to note for the record that you you looked at two potential origins of a of a possible pandemic one was natural the other one was uh, we call supernatural it was a lab leak it's in the a report signed by the president of the United States, uh, Donald Trump. Um, what happened to that document in terms of implementation? I mean, I and I don't want to be in any way critical because what you did with Operation Warp Speed, which we'll get to in a second, was absolutely unbelievable. Uh, you know, in partnership with some incredible people in defense, or the Department of Defense, and uh, your uh, deputy chief of staff at HHS. But we had, thanks to your work a biodefense strategy that if implemented, if it, including intelligence and early warning that was supposed to be there. Why did it, we know some of the intelligence was downgraded. Uh, it wasn't by you, obviously. 
Uh, do you have any idea what happened from your perspective, or is this just the chaos of dealing with an actual pandemic that, and, and, and that, that you can practice all day and you're never ready for the real thing like we learned in 9-11? Well, you know, it's interesting because two things. Uh, first of all, I just want to uh, laud the effort that was done with that national biodefense strategy, which really represented a consolidation of a, of a number of presidential directives and strategies that were first uh, drafted by George W. Bush. I happened to be the scribe for HSPD-10, NSPD-33, which was the, the precursor to that strategy, as well as several that were done later by the Bush administration and the Obama administration. So what you were holding up was what I'd say the pinnacle of what our, our thinking was. But like every great thought, if there's not effort and action to make it real, meaning implement it, that's where the challenge is. Now that started in 2018, the, the effort was to, to really review across the US government what was being done, that was done. And then it was the issue, and, and this gets to, to the partisan nature of what I think uh, you know challenges us, and quite frankly, I can point to warp speed as an example of it, is that it used to be said that foreign policy ends at the at our domestic shores, that we were unified in our view of the threat, particularly during the Cold War. Well, unfortunately, that document and 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 the purpose of behind it was not necessarily had the bipartisan uh, buy-in from our Democratic colleagues that I think, you know, I think really did inhibit our ability to prepare for that. Um, you know, I made uh, several forays to the Hill um, trying to to basically talk about the strategy and talk about the resources that were needed to do the strategy. And, and quite frankly, that was a that was a challenge, uh, to say the least. And then you see that kind of as a result of warp speed when highly successful as that that was, it was like warp speed didn't, you know, didn't exist when the new administration came in. They they took it apart basically they put it in the closet and then here most recently now have said well maybe we need it again and they're calling it next gen i don't care care if you call it a ham sandwich the fact that they uh eliminated or or stopped the program when they did uh literally cost american lives and so yeah, yeah it's it's just it's a very troubling set of you know like you said that strategy that they're they're intent putting a new strategy out which is their own uh, that I guess that's the right of every president to redo that. But I think that the the document that you held up was a very good document that reflected the efforts of two previous administration, Bush and Obama, to 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 draft that. And and for some reason, um, you know, it, it's not good enough now, and we have to get rid of it mm -hmm. and, and do away with it. And, and so the problem is, is that. You know the the politicization of of this issue has been argued to be belong to one side and not the other. But quite frankly, it's evident that that uh, you know partisanship has really uh, undermined our ability to manage this pandemic. And if we can't get our act together, it will affect future efforts uh, against this threat, particularly when it could have been an accidental uh, event which is, again, uh, something that this administration seems to be hard, hard to kind of get their attention to. Yeah. To replace. I mean, I, I do find it sort of incredible because objectively, uh, it's well known to pretty much everybody who's, who has any background, and, and a few of us have the level of background you do in biology uh, and in the, in, in, in the, the government's uh, the preparedness for biological events, be they natural or, as they said, supernatural, uh, like for a lab accident, um, there, there's just, it's obvious that if you can reverse engineer COVID-19 based on a sequence that was posted in, you know, you know, second week of January or something like that, uh, January 9th, January. January 9th or so, I mean, you know, we didn't have access to COVID-19. We had access to a sequence. We printed that sequence in DNA and, and managed to recreate it. Um, so we could experiment to create a vaccine against it, which, uh, again, your efforts uh, as ASPR uh, were sort of monumentally uh, significant in, in attaining. Um, but but obviously, you know, if you can reverse it in synthetic biology, you can create a synthetic biology. So, so COVID-2025 or COVID-2030 is just around the corner. And uh, you and I both worked on the issue of potential bioterrorism. I mean, now the ability to uh, to to print uh, uh, genetic material uh, is 
it's, it's not something that even high school AP students are learning how to do. I don't know if you've got thoughts on on, on that issue um, uh, as we look ahead. We've got a few minutes left. Uh, and, sure. and, you know, well, I, I just think that you know, yeah. you literally know more about this as a threat. One last point. Also, to just reflect on NIAID's funding for biodefense, um, $38.5 billion since 2002. We will be issuing a report from Hudson in the coming uh, weeks about this. Uh, very little, I mean, first, initially great impact, but over the years, it seems to have just become its own self looking ice cream cone uh, under Dr. Fauci. And, and it's really a question is like, what biodefense do they actually do, except create bio threats, which if they got out, could be hugely detrimental. How do you fix that? Sure. Well, well, first of all, I think you've touched on a number of issues. One I would like to first uh, say is, you know, there needs to be accounting of what worked and what didn't work. And I think you've highlighted a couple of them uh, early on with early warning missed opportunities and early warning linked with uh, the failures to be able to institute, uh, you know, timely interventions. Uh, President Trump was very quick to to uh, invoke when he when he when he did the the travel restrictions. But had that been done 60 days earlier, that could have been all the difference in the world. Witness Taiwan. Uh, we certainly had the successes of warp speed, but but I think the thing is is that we do need to understand that in the era of biosynthetic uh, synthetic biology, that who we uh, give grants to and for what we give grants to do do deserve greater uh, uh, scrutiny. I think that is something that, quite frankly, in our investigation, we identified that the oversight of those kinds of grants and that oversight of those kinds of research and not validating the end user, if you will, who was using it, who was doing it, and how they were doing it in terms of their biosafety competence. I think there was plenty of opportunity to probably say no to some of these grants that probably contributed. You know the proliferation problem. Money is fungible. Data is fungible. Techniques are fungible. That in this kind of biosynthetic world, we need to do better. The other thing is, is that we kind of need to clean up our house at home. Uh, there's a book that was just published by Allison Young that's called uh, Panda, Pandera, uh, Pandora's uh, Problem or, or Paradox. It, it really does highlight, I think, uh, the nature that we're subsidizing uh, research in our own country today that is risky, and we just need to acknowledge it. it. It some of it has to be done, but clearly the 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 due diligence around who was doing it and how it was being done. Uh, one that occurred on on my watch, I didn't realize that there were sci uh, biosafety problems historically with the institution that was involved, but yet that was a grant given by NIH who knew that deficiency, and then when there was an incident. NIH found out about it and didn't tell anybody about it. Yeah. And so there's this issue of transparency. So there's a lot that we can do across the spectrum. Uh, we got to clean up our own whole house, if you will, initially. We need to set the standard for the rest of the world, and we need to gauge countries like China and others, uh, hopefully collaboratively. But if not, we just need to do what's in our best interest. And we have to realize that in, in today's connected world, biosynthetic world, that we're going to need to be prepared for the next accident as well as natural outbreak. Or yeah, I mean, it's a very important point um, because uh, the um, it could happen in the United States too. I mean, we could be easily create uh, a massive pan potential pandemic pathogen uh, in a U.S. laboratory at almost any major university in the United States, let alone our own national laboratories. And if it got out, it would be uh, our our responsibility to warn it about it to help defend against it and to uh you know basically uh, stop it disrupt it um so it's not this is not just about china this is a global problem the i must say though having investigated the chinese role and uh, the pro uh, likely promulgation of covid 19 uh, however accidental in origin and uh, at least in my view this was an accident maybe multiple accidents but also the cover-up. The cover-up was just absolutely systematic. And, and, and you're, you're very correct. One of the most telling elements is that Taiwan, which is, you know, uh, uh, you know, Republic of China across the strait, 
shut down its borders on January 2nd. Uh, and in fact, it was shut down well before that, as you point out in December, they were already under a lockdown in effect because uh, they had good bio threat intelligence. Um, we obviously did not. Um, or when we did have intelligence, we didn't disseminate it for whatever reasons. There's so many things that could be learned from this so we don't have it happen again. But I think one of the biggest things is why the NIH is funding research in countries that are essentially adversaries and declared adversaries in the United States. China does not hide its uh, ambitions to usurp the United States and Asia uh, and our allies. I mean, why we're providing money and uh, it, it, including to, to programs that as we uncovered at the State Department were in part being funded by the People's Liberation Army. Um, it's ridiculous if you think about it. I mean, we're providing material uh, aid to an uh, adversary. And whether they wanted this for bioweapons uh, or not is a question. I guess my final question to you is how do you define biodefense and what's legitimate in, in the era we live in? And we know that the Biological Weapons Convention does allow for people to create potential pandemic pathogens. But um, if they get out, then what should be the ramification? I mean, what, 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 you know, you've been involved in foreign policy. What do you think the ramification should be for China looking ahead for having covered up COVID-19. We know that for certain. Yeah, Whether well, it created it is highly probable, but let's just say 99% maybe it's my book, but the cover-up was much worse than the crime. Well, I think the two things that come to mind immediately, one is the uh, prohibitions under the Biological Weapons Convention, which, which allows countries to do things that are for peaceful and prophylactic purposes. So the fact that at least what in our investigation we found was that the the events may have been associated with a vaccine related re, uh, research um, is 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 one part of the issue that says well you know that th that's okay but but the international health regulations which uh, require countries and China is one of the signatories to that to no make notifications and makes a special no uh, mention of SARS as being one of those things that you absolutely positively should notify the world about. Uh, within 48 hours uh, was clearly something that they did not um, abide by, and, and that is, and and we can we can we can quibble over when did they know what in terms of uh, what what may have happened. One of the things intriguing things we we found uh, is that it, that maybe the initial cover up was from local provincial. Uh, authorities and but yet that would that would be disputed by uh the one fact that we had where the 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 representative from Beijing came down the the biosecurity expert invoking the name of uh Xi Jinping uh and 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 mentioning of a pishur or, or implying a pishur so it, it does point out that there is uh a a kind of an obligation by every country to to abide by this I think probably the one leg that's missing from the stool is really internationalizing the, the requirement for biosafety and also uh, biosecurity around this kind of risky research period. Um, it clearly was a matter of China, concern in China. They actually passed uh, drafted legislation prior to the pandemic in September of 2019 uh, that outlined the requirements to to do this kind of research, which to me infers or at least implies that there may have been some earlier event that made them aware of the dangers of this kind of research. And, and they were trying to either fix the problems or even uh, may have been trying to keep the lid on what was a potentially emerging event earlier than we knew. But it does require, I think, uh, all countries including China, to be transparent. It does require them to be accountable as we would be accountable. And as I said, we have room to, for improvement and we need to make those improvements sooner than later uh, because we are kind of whistling in the dark if we don't think this can happen here in the United States. Well, thank you, Dr. Kalik. Uh, we really appreciated the opportunity to uh, discuss uh, the origins of COVID-19 and your uh, uh, work on biodefense over several decades uh, here today. Uh, I hope we'll have a chance to uh, continue the conversation in the future at, a, at the Hudson event. I want to um, uh, develop a, a, a more focused uh, review 
uh, in support of the Congress's uh, investigation, the origins, and we definitely want to tap into your incredible knowledge and experience and, and, and your, uh, you know, your capabilities as a scholar, not just as a, uh, a practitioner. Um, but uh, we are very grateful for your time today. Thank you. David, thank you. And again, uh, really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you and, and uh, convey this to your uh, colleagues and to the viewership here. Thank you.